Fatal? Uh-oh, I'm having issues already here. Hang on. There we go. Don't touch the cords. Okay, let's give ourselves a little title here. Homeostatic control of uh, blood calcium level. That's sort of our title. It's important for you to distinguish between calcium in the blood and calcium in the tissues. So our cells need calcium for various things, as Lauren told us already. But there's also blood in, in uh, sorry, calcium in the bloodstream, right? So we have to make sure we're always thinking about where the calcium is that we're talking about. If calcium is in your blood, it's not in your cells. And if it's in your cells, it's not in your blood. So when we talk about high calcium levels in the blood, that means we're talking specifically about calcium that's in the bloodstream itself and not necessarily available yet to things that might need it. Okay, so first of all, why do we need calcium? Why is this so important, first of all? Well, it turns out calcium it is critical for many body processes. What were some of those things you mentioned, Lauren? All right. We'll talk a little bit more about bones. Teeth, you said. Basically, structures that contain min mineralized calcium, right? Bones, teeth. Uh, did I hear you said muscles? Nerves and brain? All of these things involve calcium to some degree. Calcium, it turns out, is a very um, widespread regulator of things. Calcium can bind to proteins on cell membranes, and it can change the shape and nature of those proteins, opening gates through cells for transport, changing the way the cells behave. In particular, with muscle cells, um, you might have learned a little bit about muscles in grade 11, depending. And you may have learned about the two fibers. There's the actin and myosin fibers that make up muscle cells. And these two fibers work together with a complex sort of bonding system. And, and they, when, they, when they're together, um, they, can, they can shift on each other. So the contracting of a muscle has to do with these two fibers interacting and, and pulling, which shortens the muscle. And the way that works is there are sites all along the actin fiber where myosin can bind. But there's a, a molecule that wraps around this and covers those sites. So when calcium, well, there we go. When calcium is present, what it does is it binds to receptors on the actin, like this, calcium ions. And once they're bound, it moves that little molecule to expose the myosin binding sites, which allows the myosin then to bind. And then through ATP, it can move. It's quite complex. But you can see how important calcium would be. The other interesting thing about calcium, we're talking about bones and teeth, is that evolutionarily speaking, the skeleton likely evolved... Um, not primarily as a means for anchoring muscles, but as a means for storing calcium. Calcium storage mechanism. So you can imagine, am I going too quick on the... Just let me know if you want to go back. You can imagine um, a, a simple organism, go back, way back in the story of life to invertebrates who don't have internal skeletons, right? Go way back and you'll have these creatures, worm-like creatures, and if they live in the ocean, they tend to be in a relatively isotonic environment, right? So there's movement in and out of the cell of ions like sodium and calcium and potassium and all these things, but it's relatively in and out, it's relatively... Uh, equal. So because of the isotonicity of the 
of the ocean. But ocean conditions vary, especially if you are near a freshwater river delta where water is coming pouring into the ocean. The salinity decreases. So if you are an organism that's in sort of what we'll call fresher water, which has a lower concentration of minerals, fresher water, then what will happen is you'll tend to lose more calcium and other minerals than you will gain because you're in what's called a hypotonic environment, right? The outside environment has less solute. So now you're at a disadvantage. But if you have mineralized deposits of calcium inside of you that are sort of held together in a solid form, they're going to be protected from this osmotic movement, this osmotic pressure, right? And that means that those, they're not going to be lost. So these original organisms that were more, more successful at surviving actually had calcium deposits inside of them. These calcium deposits over time became large lumps of calcium, which eventually became integrated with cells that produce calcium, and then eventually bone, and then eventually more complex internal skeletons. So calcium is very important. Now, this, this evolutionary feature is, is important to understand too, because if your body's low on calcium, we don't live in the ocean anymore, we're not worms, but this mechanism still exists. So if you don't have enough blood level calcium, you're going to have your bones begin to dissolve. Your body will use your bones as a source of calcium. You've heard of osteoporosis, right? As you get older, your bones become more brittle because the calcium is being leached out. So the importance of calcium in your diet to prevent that. All right. So now we're going to see the mechanism that controls this. And we're going to draw ourselves a little flow chart. Um, before we do that, though, I'm just going to write over here. Well, I'm going to write it here. Why not? I want you to remember the, the general overall homeostatic mechanism, right? We have some kind of stimulus, something that changes, it changes what's going on. And then there has to be some kind of something to sense that change. So then we had a sensor of some sort. Then we had an integrator, something that integrates. Uh, and, and by integrator, we mean something that sort of responds in a way that regulates or controls. And that integrator then communicates with the effector, and then the effector produces some sort of response. I'll just put it down here. Some sort of response. So as we go through this specific example of calcium, watch for those different parts. We'll see if we can identify them. Okay. All right, so we're going to draw a nice little flow chart. We'll go up here. Is everybody caught up with me there? All good? Okay. Let's draw a little flow chart and see if we can't um, figure out how this works. Um, this particular flow chart I'm drawing is not in your textbook. I'm taking it from the AP textbook, so you're going to have to make sure you copy this one down for sure. Uh, just to get more page here. All right. So, yeah. At least a half. At least a half. Okay. In fact, you know what? Make it a full page, and you won't be sorry. Because um, I'm actually, I'm not, I think I'm going to do it sideways, because I have more sideways space than down space. So in the middle, I'm going to put here, uh, in a nice red color, the uh, the sort of homeostasis condition. So the homeostasis. This is what our body's trying to keep us to uh, within homeostasis. So a calcium level, and it's usually somewhere around 10 milligrams per hundred mils of blood. We don't need to worry about that number, but that's that's basically what it is. So what that means is that it's going to hover around 10. If it gets anything lower than 10 then the body starts to get a little nervous and says, we need more calcium in the blood, and we'll see how that's regulated. If it gets a little higher, the body says, ooh, that's making me nervous too, and we get a little bit more calcium. Than, uh, another process. Too little calcium in your blood. I don't know if you know about, you ever heard about tetanus? You know when you get a tetanus shot? 
when you get a tetanus shot, uh, it's a bacteria that produces a toxin, right? That, uh, um, the bacteria that you're trying to prevent with the tetanus shot. So tetanus is a, is a word that is, it describes the bacteria. It also describes the toxin that these bacteria make. So when you get the vaccine, it prevents this bacteria from giving you this horrible condition. But if you don't have a vaccine and you get tetanus, what it does is it interferes with the way calcium is uh, deposited into the blood and into bone. And it causes low blood level calcium, which means that you get this weird sort of muscular uh, fibrillation. Your muscles start to contract and, and relax extremely fast. Because calcium, one of its roles is to sort of regulate and control muscle contraction, right? So with, if it's too low, you go into this weird state where you lock all up and your muscles are contracting very rapidly. Uh, we used to call it lock jaw because you couldn't move your jaw, you couldn't move your mouth. You could probably ask your grandparents about lock jaw and they probably know somebody who had it as a kid or whatever because they may not have had tetanus vaccines back then, right? These are things we don't worry about anymore because no big deal. We have a vaccine, everything's good. So that's just one of the things that can happen if your blood calcium level gets too low. So it's bad news. Okay, so let's say that the blood level uh, begins to fall. So I'm going to use um, blue on the bottom for the, for the lowering. So if this blood level begins to fall, right? So we're going to say falling level. Now, why would it begin to fall? Well, you haven't eaten very much calcium. It's being used up, and you, uh, you're not drinking your milk, essentially. So it begins to fall. So your body has to respond and say, okay, well, if you're not going to drink milk, we've got to do something to get this calcium back up to this nice level, or hovering around 10. So this would be the changing conditions, which would be the stimulus in the overall response mechanism, right? The stimulus. So there's your falling blood level. So then what happens is the falling blood level it has a direct effect on the uh, parathyroid gland. Do you remember how we said that there's different, three different ways that um, the endocrine glands can work, or three different pathways? One of them was the simple pathway that doesn't involve the brain, right? where the, the changing condition simply affects the parathyroid itself. Whereas before, the other pathway would be the changing condition is involved in a nerve response, which first goes to the brain and then goes to the endocrine gland, like the parathyroid. This is a direct one, so it's one of the more simple ones. So the parathyroid then releases parathyroid hormone. Let me uh, put that in smaller font here. Parathyroid gland releases PTH, parathyroid hormone. I'm going to write PTH, but in your notes, you might want to write it all out so you're sure. Parathyroid hormone. It's on our list from yesterday. And the parathyroid hormone then travels through the bloodstream <coughs> to uh, the rest of the body. And it essentially does two or three different things. So we're going to put an arrow up like this. And the first thing it does is it goes to the skeletal system. So I'm going to draw a little bone here. Okay. And it signals cells in, uh, in the skeletal system to release calcium into the blood. So bones release calcium. And that's to get the blood levels back up, obviously. And this can work. For a temporary thing, right? But of course, the problem arises if you're consistently low in calcium in your blood and you're always pulling it out of your bones, you end up with the conditions of osteoporosis and whatnot. Um, the other thing that can happen is do you remember what we talked about uh, two days ago? And there's a certain organ that was involved in the osmotic control of water balance. Remember the kidney? Well, it also regulates electrolytes. Remember we talked about that? So what this can do is uh, it can stimulate the kidney to take back extra calcium. So we'll draw ourselves a little kidney here. Put the little irritor out. And under here we'll write uh, kidneys reclaim calcium. 
So in other words, there's no point letting this calcium escape in your urine. The kidneys will reclaim it. I can't. Both things happen. It's not either or, it's both things happen. Now the kidneys also do another interesting thing. I don't know if you know this, but uh, you need vitamin D, right? Vitamin D, what's it good for? It's good if you get a cold. Yeah, they're actually showing that vitamin D has a lot more, uh, does a lot more things than what we were accustomed to. But the most famous thing was you need vitamin T for, or vitamin D for, it does. It helps absorb calcium in the bloodstream, which means strong bones and teeth, right? And all the kids were told, drink your milk because it has calcium, but it also has vitamin D. Now we're seeing that vitamin D also plays a huge role in the immune system. So uh, people who are uh, immunocompromised are often taking vitamin D, right? Kind of an important thing. But vitamin D comes primarily in two forms. You could eat it or you can get it from sunlight. But when you get it from eating or from sunlight, it's formed in the body in sort of an inactive form. And the vitamin D needs to be activated. So, and that happens at the kidney as well. So the kidney also activates vitamin D. And as uh, somebody said, did you say something about um, increasing calcium uptake into the blood? Yeah. So activating vitamin D. which basically puts it in a form where it can do that very thing. It can increase the calcium coming into the bloodstream. Okay, and it actually acts, uh, it actually acts on the intestines. Activating vitamin D, um, and let's just put in brackets over here, that increases calcium absorption from the, di uh, from the digestive system. In, in your intestines. So all these things get sort of turned on, and obviously that makes sense if your blood calcium is dropping. We're going to borrow a little bit from the bones. We're going to try to get the kidneys to stop getting rid of it. And we're going to activate this vitamin D so that when we're eating our vitamin, or our, uh, eating our calcium, in our, drinking our milk and eating our yogurt, it's going to be more easily absorbed into our body. So these are all ways to get the vitamin D that we want. And of course then, that means that if all these things are happening, then all three of these contribute to the response, which is increasing calcium blood levels. Blood calcium levels. And that of course then feeds back to homeostasis, because it was dropping, all of this happens, brings it back up. So this bottom loop that I've drawn here, I, I'm going to draw another loop on top, but this is the bottom loop. Do you leave room on top? Yep, good, because I wrote it in the middle. I was hoping you would. Um, if you didn't leave room on top, you can just redraw the whole thing again. It they don't have to be connected. It's just kind of neat to see the two, the two things together. Okay, are we good there? I'll wait a minute. Okay, so now that we're finished with this, we, we talked about the the lowering or falling level of calcium in the blood is being the stimulus. The integrator here, of course, it's not the brain because the brain isn't involved in this process. It's the simple endocrine pathway. So the integrator is really the parathyroid gland itself. It's sort of making, uh, I, I, I want to say making the decision, but it's not a conscious decision. It's a response to a chemical gradient, right? But it's doing the thing that immediately causes uh, so the effectors, which are the bones and the kidneys, to change their behavior. And then, of course, the response is the increasing blood calcium levels. Good. All right. I'm going to go back up to the top. Yep, the falling level would be the stimulus. I'm going to go up to the top and do mine at the top. If you don't have room, just write the word homeostasis again and just draw, uh, write it at the bottom of your diagram, and we'll just circle upwards, that's all. I have the luxury of being able to erase this stuff and making space, whereas you don't. Okay, so now we'll just kind of go around the other way. 
and we'll look at what happens. I'll do this in a different color, because this is the opposite process. So let's go over here, and let's see what happens if we get a rising level of calcium in the blood. Hey, did you check in at the office? You had what? Oh, grab pictures. Okay. Weird, eh? Anyway. I will try not to move. Rising level. So this is the opposite effect. So, of course, what happens? Well, this time, this time, it's not the parathyroid, it's the thyroid gland that responds. So, wow. Weird. So the rising level here is going to affect the thyroid this time. Not the parathyroid, but the thyroid gland. It's sensitive to the rising levels. And it's going to release, I'll put it in smaller, smaller words here. It releases, what's the uh, hormone again? The easy one, because it starts with cal. Calcitonin releases cal. Calcitonin. And calcitonin essentially does the opposite. It travels through the bloodstream to the bones. Whoop, this guy's had a, a break in his femur. You can see the spot there where it went wiggly. So this skeleton, uh, skeletal absorption of calcium. Instead of the bones releasing calcium, the bones are now, the, the bone cells themselves are uptaking calcium from the blood and they're integrating it into new bone tissue. So they're building blood. Skeletal absorption of calcium ions. And it will signal the kidneys. We'll draw a little kidney here. And it signals the kidneys this time. And it basically says, don't, don't try so hard to save the calcium. We have lots. So the kidneys will then... Um, he will uh, allow the calcium to sort of seep into the filtrate inside the, the tubule. Remember all that from the kidney. And this will reduce the uptake of calcium into the tissue. So we'll say that it reduces calcium uptake. In other words, more calcium ends up in your urine. And it's emitted from the body because you don't need it. And then, of course, the response would be a lowering of the blood level calcium. Lowering of calcium blood level. Which then brings us back to our state of homeostasis. So these two processes are working in conjunction with each other. And it's this juggling act. And things get too high, we get the blue circle. Or sorry, too low, we get the blue circle. When things get too high, we get the green circle. And this is how your body maintains that nice, even keel. Yes. Well, yeah, because look, it says rising level, right? So the green is what happens when the, cal the calcium level rises. And it makes sense, because if it's rising, you're, you're putting it into bone, and you're putting it into urine, and you're get ri getting rid of it to try to lower it back down, right? All right. Any questions on that one? We're good to go? Okay, I'm going to stop the video. Uh, I'm